Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at GOMA and um, our exhibition Water on uh, day two of the exhibition. Uh, my name is Geraldine Kirihibalo. Um, I'm the curator of the exhibition and also really um, thrilled to have my colleague Sophie Rose here who's worked with me from the uh, beginning of the development of the exhibition. And um, one of the projects that's been a really great delight for us uh, is uh, Michael Candy's um, Little Sunfish project. So um, many of you may have seen his uh, film within the um, first part of the gallery after you pass through the initial um, darker space and it's in a section that we called kind of pulse and playing on um, a screen there. Um, so um, you'll get some sense of it if you haven't seen it from our, our conversation, but please check it out later otherwise. And uh, beside Michael, we've got Professor Matthew Dunbaben um, from QUT. So welcome to both um, Michael and Matthew. And I'm doing things like slightly flipping around here, but also just wanted to do um, a bit of an acknowledgement of um, where we are here on the Brisbane um, River, the Maywa, um, at Kurilpa, Kurilpa Point, uh, home to the Kurul um, in uh, Indigenous history. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, the um, generations who've lived here, um, their elders and uh, emerging leaders and um, hope that we can all um, continue in this kind of spirit of uh, gathering and conversations. Um, so, Michael, if I can just um, ask you um, perhaps to uh, talk a little bit about um, sunfish, but perhaps in context with um, the history of your practice and how you came to use um, robotics, uh, one of these kind of focuses of our, our talk today. Um, uh, hello. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michael. Um, yeah, so uh, I think for me, for the past, like, I don't know, however many years, I've been building robotic sculptures, um, and they seem to exist um, in kind of isolated situations where not, not necessarily that many people get to see the work uh, in front of them. They'd rather see video documentation. And so for me to, like, do a project like Little Sunfish, it was like the building those robot submarines and stuff was not... Um, the core outcome, it was the video. So like I kind of flipped that methodology on its head, um, which is, yeah, a new a new way of working for me, I guess. And could you tell us a bit, you, I, I, you began studying industrial design, but then shifted across to art. Yeah, so I, I graduated from uh, QUT in 2013 with a visual arts degree and uh, basically failed industrial design degree. <laughs> I think I, I did uh, design, uh, industrial design studio for like a year and a half uh, during my degree. So um, yeah, I think it was something I actually, I, I wanted to become an industrial designer. And um, after kind of doing it and realizing the sort of focus of the field I wanted to create without any sort of commercial intent, and that's why I'm always broke from my artwork, so. Um. And um, Little Sunfish, can you um, share with our audience like maybe an overview of the, uh, the narrative of the work and? Uh... Yeah, sure thing. So um, Geraldine and I began discussing this show and we weren't really sure of what kind of outcome uh, you know, whether it would even be in the show, but Geraldine was like, I'm working with this show, we're looking at water, and we had these discussions, and then one thing we happened upon was, um, I became, I'm of course obsessed with robots, but um, <laughs> there were these harrowing tales of the robots in uh, Fukushima Daiichi power plant, and um, how they were just losing them to radiation, but there was this one particular case, Little Sunfish was what they named, the ROV that they sent into the flooded reactor uh, number three. Um, and so it's, it's flooded with coolant water and they hadn't seen inside it until 2017 where they sent this like cylindrical shaped cute little robot in there and it documented and, and found the uh, melted debris. So it was actually a successful mission um, and there was a lot of press around the real little sunfish which was quite a bit bigger than the one I built. but. Um, Still today at Fukushima, there's a huge debate about whether they're going to release the tritiated water into the ocean because they've 
They've been filtering water and they've frozen the earth solid around the reactor and done everything they possibly can to stop radioactive water seeping into the ocean. But um, there's still um, a lot of water that they actually just accumulate and carry in these huge uh, silos on site. And so, of course, water is very topical of the Fukushima disaster. It both caused it and it's a current problem. And so Little Sunfish, in this fictional narrative, escapes the reactor and inadvertently spreads radiation into the ocean. So I guess that's mm. kind of what we ended up with. <laughs> and it's, um, I mean, something that I really love about the work is that um, in a way, uh, in the guise of a kind of adventure story and also a narrative about um, uh, technology that we create uh, kind of coming to uh, carry a kind of sentience and quality of curiosity and, and playfulness, but there's um, inadvertent um, harm that occurs and damage, yeah. And um, maybe um, if, Matthew, I'm just um, interested to um, hear from you about, um, you know, how you come to, came to work uh, in the field of environmental robotics and um, you particularly um, work with uh, submersible robots, don't you? Uh, correct, yeah, so um, I'm a professor at QUT, but before that I had, I grew up in the bush, had an affinity with the bush, and became an engineer in the mining game. And it got to a point in my mid-twenties where we're doing mining robotics, and um, I was so efficient at moving dirt, as in a hundred tonne a minute of dirt, that I had a conscience uh, change and I said, okay, this is pretty advanced technology, but can we actually do the reverse? Can we start to protect the environment, conserve the environment? And my best friends at the time were uh, marine scientists at the University of Queensland, actually. And um, we got together and we started looking at some of the big problems facing, particularly the Great Barrier Reef at the time. Uh, Crown-of-thorn starfish was just emerging as a, it'd been known, but it was emerging as a serious threat to the Great Barrier Reef. So, we thought, well, okay, let's make robotic systems that now become advanced enough that we can actually make them do something useful in the environment. And that was the sort of the, um, the instigation of where I first became involved in environmental robotics. Mm. And um, can you tell us a little bit about, um, I mean, you've, you've had a, um, some of your projects uh, have a kind of um, monitoring kind of aspect to um, give us a kind of... Um, almost um, visual or data access, uh, but then you've kind of also, we were talking about the moving towards action. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the context of robotics broadly, and some of you may have drones and everything like that, they're typically used for monitoring the environment to generate maps or do, do something. And it's all done, all the analysis, all the actions are done post. Well, there's actually a really good reason to do things in situ. You, you might be chasing down a marine pest or, a, or something like this. You have to do it then and there. And that's been the focus of our research in particular is closing that loop between perception, how do we look at the environment, understand the environment, to action. And to do that within a, a robotic system is you know, making its own decisions is sort of the core research of where we're dealing. So we've got now examples where you may have heard that um, it's actually, actually our first prototype is actually in the Queensland Museum. Uh, a robot called Cotspot, and that was a robot designed to autonomously detect crown of thorn starfish and actually inject them. These are starfish that eat the Great Barrier Reef. We've now got robotic systems that are deploying coral on degraded coral reefs. We actually did that last week in the Great Barrier Reef. We've now we've done three hectares in uh, the Philippines. Um, we've got robots that are actually monitoring and taking physical water samples along our water storages here in Queensland, um, particularly as we move into an area where we may be another drought season. So. Um, there's lots of examples where we're now starting to close that loop of just monitoring, but say, okay, let's do something purposeful while we're there. Mm. And um, can you, I think something that, it, I find it incredible, the capacity and kind of wonderful that you can uh, adapt uh, your skills across these different systems and you were showing me something about the um, turtle monitoring. Yeah, so one of the great things about my particular job is I get to work with ecologists, marine scientists, um, terrestrial ecologists, all sorts of people, and they have pretty wicked problems. And one of them in particular, right now there's a group of Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service officers at Rain Island. This is a, 
And this is a um, the world's most important green turtle rookery, but it's under threat from climate change. Sea level rise is actually killing the turtles. Um, the, sorry, inundating the eggs and we're getting population crashes. But on any given night, there could be 30,000 turtles around that island. I want to know how the population's changing. So our algorithms that we employ on our underwater robots we're actually got now in drones and they're actually doing real-time turtle counts to understand you know, the population, how many are there at any particular time, how many are nesting, that type of thing. We've got some videos here that I can show people. It's really exciting. This is technology now that's, you know, it's, we can now put it nearly on a smartphone. It, it, we've got to that point where, um, depending on, um, on the application, we can tailor it. We've got colleagues that are working on koalas, all sorts of things mm. like that. It's a fast moving area, isn't it? And um, so much needs to be done, but then also the ethical landscape is very interesting and complex, isn't it? Because when we think about um, a um, autonomous, semi-autonomous robot um, able to uh, kill Crown of Thorns um, starfish or some yeah. of the um, recognition software and then we think about how these uh, technologies might be um, militarised. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how Absolutely. you navigate those challenges? So as an example, the very first press release we put out about our Crown of Thorns starfish robot it was side by side with Terminator pictures. Um, <laughs> And, but the, the thing is, the public actually recognise that it's not the same. It's a totally different context. But you're absolutely right. And where, where do we start being perceived as playing God in a lot of these situations? Mm -hmm. um, the great thing for the areas that I work in is we're quite heavily regulated from our marine parks, our environment departments. And they actually do a great job on sort of questioning absolutely everything. They don't want to take unnecessary risks. So even though our technology is way more advanced than what you see on these examples, we're doing baby steps because we don't want that cane toad problem. We don't want to be introducing something that has the undesired effect. Mm. Um, and a lot of the time, we are actually just sandbagging the situation that might be um, rebuilding coral reefs, for example. Robots aren't necessarily the full solution to that, mm. but we are providing a means until we come up with policy and strategy for clim addressing climate change that we don't lose all our reefs in that period mm. so we're using technology at the moment in an appropriate fashion for environmental conservation yeah. and could i do a little um segue to michael on that um and i know i think this is a subject that we, we might be juggling microphones a bit but um we t i was interested to ask you a bit about the um you know open source kind of sharing of a lot of the um research that you're doing and great to hear about I suppose try, this um, sense of trying to um, realise the possibility of larger scale change and sharing of information and you were mentioning the philanthropic support that you have, um, that that attracts a lot of support for. Um, and then um, Michael, you use um, a lot of uh, open source uh, material in, um, in your work but often you're kind of um, rewiring it in interesting ways and I'm just there might be many pathways on this but I'd love if, love it if you could share with people the project um, you did some of your projects are quite kind of guerrilla and the one where you um, uh, climbed the was it in Paris yeah oh, okay <laughs> um, yeah so I, I of course don't always work with video or um, strictly robotic sculpture but yeah there, there was a work in 2015 or yeah, I think it was 2015, maybe. Uh, but it was uh, during the Neut de Boue protests in Paris, in Republic Square. I installed a device that would cause the statue to cry every time a bombing was reported in Syria. So it was kind of like flipping this like live data on its head and bringing it back to... Uh, there was a, a very relevant reason why that site, but I mean, that's a, that's a whole other discussion. Yeah. But... Um, yeah, I think uh, using open source technologies and, and uh, has been very core to my practice and my, and my sort of ethos. I used to actually have a section on my website where I just shared all the design files for everything I'm doing. Um, and I do plan on releasing some of the, the files that were used to create Little Sunfish, actually, because the, the replica was just built on photographs and then I had to, like, redesign the whole robot and figure out how to make a version that actually operates underwater. 
Um, and there's whole communities online that I think would benefit from that because it's made out of a lot of different uh, like remote control helicopters and yeah. all sorts of found and hacked objects. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, the hack is pretty interesting, isn't it? And um, Little Sunfish, you know, sometimes we're seeing his uh, point of view, aren't we? And there's a kind of um, this aspect where he's uh, got a social engagement. He meets um, a cuttlefish. And I'm interested in um, how uh, both of you kind of consider this quality of um, maybe um, the... Uh, human quality of um, the machines that are built and um, and how that sits in a kind of ethical uh, landscape of care? Yeah, well, maybe I'll hand this to you in a, in a minute, I'm sure. But um, so with Little Sunfish, that was something that, were, that we thought about a lot and talked about. And so for the first sort of part of the film, Little Sunfish doesn't blink or like move its, its camera at all. Um, and then there's a moment where it's sort of almost reborn and it has these eyelids and it can sort of display subtle emotions and, and it just becomes that much more animated when it has these little, it identifiable as a sort of like, um, yeah, I suppose like a Pixar character or and something. I loved it. It's kind of like, as with evolution, it's exposure to radiation that seems to, um, you know, um, push that, that change in his um, evolution. Yeah, yeah, well, that was something that was quite interesting as well because... Um, it's all based on material found online through uh, through TEPCO's website. Actually, they release a lot of the data found uh, when they send these robots into the reactor, um, and you can see a lot of footage of them actually just going in and dying. Like, so they'll go in, and the camera will slowly start to fuzz up. And mm. this is actually like you can see the radiation just hitting the the image sensor, mm. and it's like a really vivid, I don't know, like kind of terrifying thing when you identify that sort of object it's like it, it's an object of human intent but um yeah. here it is dying you know and i suppose it's kind of swimming past the kind of corpses as it were of its kind of brethren that went before yeah well little, little sunfish they hadn't sent anything in yet but yeah. yeah in the other reactors they are they have found their other robots and driven past them and yeah, yeah it's kind of and I'll it, oh yeah i think yeah totally in terms of acceptance um, of robotic systems for these environments. If you actually look at our Ranger bot uh, underwater vehicle, everybody tells me um, the front looks like Wally or something, you know, an emotive. That was actually very deliberate because as a technologist, I can design pretty much anything, but we actually worked with industrial designers to get that subtle face happening. And the way that we do our lighting sequence for errors and status sort of gives that, it's sort of a, a non, you know, we don't have to talk in the digital world, we can do this visual or that emotive sort of a step mm -hmm. with it. Um, and over at QUT, just across the river here, we actually have a whole group looking at social robotics. How do robots interact with the public more generally? Like those subtle cues, nods, gestures, those types of things that make them more acceptable uh, instead of just trying to control them through your phone or whatever. So having that uh, personal interaction or is a fantastic thing, yeah. I, I just... Add, um, I was reading a, a pretty interesting article recently on um, uh, people in war zones actually having funerals for their bomb uh, detection robots. So, like, the, the soldiers become that attached to this device because it is like a martyr for them. You know, it's, it's going in and, and these ones going into reactors or, like, the ones working for the amount of hours you have your robots working for. Uh, the efficiency and, and everything you I'm sure you begin to like have an affinity with these these kind of yeah yeah right yeah exactly yeah and little sunfish I mean it's like a cute little handle for this robot that they sent into the reactor mm. I suppose and it's interesting isn't it because in some ways little sunfish uh, it's separate it's like a character that has uh, an apparent agency in a way um, but um, then also the potential to kind of multiply, and I think some of your projects, Matt, there, there are these multiple robots uh, working in unison and um, there's a sense of almost like an ecology or, or group action and, um, you know, in some ways maybe it almost goes to a larger philosophical thing that we're not really as separate as we might feel. <laughs> yeah, so I think... Um one of the big pushes that we have in our 
in our research is to ensure that if we, we put in a robot out, at the moment if we put one robot out, it usually takes one or two people. That's not the way that we want these systems to work. We want uh, one person with 10, 20 robots. We can currently do five on the reef now with one person, so they're out doing their tasks. Um, but then they have to start interacting. You mentioned that. So we've got uh, ways of swarming technology. Yeah. We, we take a lot of sort of ideas from biology. You know, you look at mm. bees, you look at fish, you look at the schooling behaviours. They're there for a reason. They do certain things. And we, we, we actually study those um, and try to embed that within our algorithms to, to give a similar behaviour. Because you've got millions of years of evolution that sort of led to that. And there's probably a reason why, why we try and recreate something that's mm. not as efficient. Can you talk a little more? I mean, uh, I think it would be a question for both of you about um, the kind of, uh, I know artists uh, the, take a lot of inspiration from, from nature. So how do you, you're at this amazing point of um, focusing your attention and capacity, but then um, sometimes inspiration and creativity can then um, amplify and create other unexpected possibilities. Yeah, so... Um, a lot of the work that I do, I'm, I'm inspired by nature and just by talking to people from different groups, um, in particular as a professor at a, um, uh, Queensland University, oh, Justin Marshall, who uh, looked at the way, he had a project called Prawns in Space. It's the way, um, animals see, the way animals see the environment under all types of different lights and that type of thing. And what we've been trying to do is try to really understand that in the digital sense, like, because once you look at the world under a different lens, things become possible that we didn't think about. You know, um, like a good example is thermal cameras and things like that. It's mm. one, but when you actually start to look at um, identification of targets with UV light or coral health with UV light, we can do a lot of new ways of looking at the environment and then the way we interact with that environment, we build our robots around that, those biology ideas. So, mm. yeah. Michael, do you have a, a perspective on that aspect of um, uh, how you balance taking inspiration from the natural world, uh, but then uh, you know applying it in? Uh yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess um, I should probably talk about uh, synthetic pollinizer, which was a work I did quite a few years ago with Shepherd and Art Museum. Um, and in the lead up to that, I worked with a resource ecologist who just kind of caught bees in the wild and then he would gas them and take them back to the lab and identify them. And we started developing this project to say like, what if we could have a synthetic flower that the bees could land on and we could photograph them and then tag them with a dye and then be able to map where the bees visit. Um, and that was further pitched to the uh, Bio Art and Design Award in the Netherlands and they weren't into it. So <laughs> it took a few more years to realize the project. Um, and I did it on my own, but it was this kind of uh, similar to your coral robot, like it was intervening in the reproduction cycle of, of like flowers, really, because it, it had pollen, it had a synthetic nectar, and it would attract bees. And um, actually, I have like footage of a bee carrying pollen away. And it's like, well, that's how it works, you know? Like, um, so for me, it's really interesting, like, you, of course, work with vision a lot and like vision systems, and that's, that is a totally digital realm. But um, when robots uh, have a physical impact or a physical presence, it is something that I kind of pursue a lot with my work. And again, with the robots in Fukushima, there was very little um, digital stuff going on because to have microprocessors operating in radioactive environments is next to impossible. So. A lot of them were like pneumatic powered or like little sunfish is very analog. Um, it was just direct drive motors and a camera, you know, like, so, um, yeah, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Mm, mm. Um, what, are, um, what are some of the projects that you're um, working on now, Mash? Can you? Um, yeah, so us? we literally last week got back from Coral Reef. Uh, so during the coral, mass coral spawning on the Great Barrier Reef, um, we've just did another collection. We actually collected 160 million coral larvae and we distributed mm. those over damaged parts of the reef, which was fantastic. Um, but a lot of the projects I have now, and this sort of goes back to a previous question, was, well, where's, who, who's interested in this technology and taking the mm. technology 
um, further. And it's actually in the environment space, even though corporates are interested, it's philanthropic. And most mm -hmm. of my funding now is coming from do very wealthy donors that just want to do something good for the environment. They don't even want to be any recognition to say, here's, we want you to help solve this problem. And a lot of that is now creating technologies. Um, for example, coral reefs and that type of thing. We're actually looking at the physical form as well as the um, technology component to make them backpackable or take them to countries mm. that need these types of services. Uh, third world countries that you can't take crates of stuff. Mm. Um, so it's all around that uh, and always trying to make robots see better. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, um, oh, I was also interested in, um, I mean, you're obviously kind of doing a lot through the um, uh, the university and your knowledge and capacity, but there's a teaching role as well, isn't there? And I know when I used to work at um, university, um, you know, young people are so uh, passionate about wanting to make a difference. And um, can you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. So um, it's actually great. I get a lot of unsolicited calls for people just wanting to work with we, from all around the mm -hmm. world and they, they come. Um, it might be from actually a personal endeavour that they have a similar problem to what we're addressing. They want to take that technology and move over there. Um, but just here at QT, we've got, we, we offer so many final year projects, students like we have vacation student projects, um, looking at all sorts of different ideas. And the ones that I actually love with the students that come up with an idea and said, oh, I'm interested in doing this. You know, and I go, okay, just do it. I'll, I'll provide some guidance, but I want you to be free and just think, you know, there's a box, be outside yeah. it. Yeah. And is it hard for um, those students to uh, kind of get a job or does the philanthropic capacity that you're able to attract make it um, easier to kind of really build those pathways and opportunities? I think there is definite opportunity. The biggest problem we have at the moment is the tech sector taking our very bright students. Um, you know, you've got Facebooks and Googles, they, they just snuffle up the capability that we have. Mm. But the ones that stay, um, they get, yeah, they, they get this funding, they get um, projects that we're supporting through collaboration with other universities. We don't necessarily do marine science, but we collaborate with multiple universities around the country and around the world that do mm. marine science. So. Um, there's always work for those type of people. Mm. There's something interesting about um, kind of power structures in a way, isn't there, in terms of our aspirations to make a better world. And mm. um, I often really love with art that it feels like you can move between systems. And I think, Michael, um, you you do that, I, I feel, in your practice. You kind of um, create this kind of commentary, but you you do it in quite a guerrilla kind of way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I can get away with it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. that's why I'm not an industrial designer. Um, but in a lot of ways, I am, you know, I still have a lot of the resources and skills gained from that short amount of time spent learning CAD and, and illustrating my ideas. But um, yeah, like your work is, is really cool to, to draw upon. I mean, I've known about I was one of those unsolicited emails once upon a time. Uh, but uh, I had the great fortune, you might know Harold Tay at Singapore National Uni. Uh, he took me through his marine biology lab and he just the way he thinks about things, like he would build the most simple ROVs that would just operate autonomous, autonomously with half a, pro a propeller and no other rudder and it would just oscillate it to like steer itself and then rise to the surface to of course transmit the signal and it's like, uh, I don't know, there's, a, there's an ingenious way that you, you, you guys work and, and of course like um, you would use a lot of like brushless motors in your um, ROVs and like one of the little sunfish, the one that had to operate in salt water had to have these tiny brushless motors. Like, so there's a lot of like industry and research that I respond to from what I can scratch up from these, uh, these like people like Matthew, mm. yeah. And I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about um, the role of collaboration then, because Michael, you're you're kind of working as like often as a sole agent, but then um, you know you've done a range of um, residencies working with um, both artists and scientists. Um, I'm always I love talking to you because you're always reading a very wide range of things and. 
Um, so it kind of strikes me that you get those sparks of inspiration um, from others, but then also you've probably got more space to go off and do things solo, but then that um, it's precarious financially, isn't it? So. Of yeah. course, <laughs> but I mean, uh, if you do what you love enough, you can you can make it work. And I think it's really inspiring that you you're able to do this environmental stuff, Matthew, and not get like snapped up by some kind of military interest or you know like I um I, I'm sure you know like Pixie Cam is like an Arduino interfaceable. And I bought one a year or so ago, and I remember, like, I bought it from the U.S. It's just a vision system that you kind of build robots with. And uh, I had to, like, f on the website, fill out this form that just said, I'm not going to supply this to anyone in the Middle East or North Korea. And it was just, like, so ridiculous because, like, like you said, it's like you could do this with a cell phone. Like, trying to limit this technology is just not really going to do anything. But, um, yeah, maybe you, maybe you have something on that. Well, that's actually, uh, in response to that, it's a big problem that we have at the moment. Our robotic systems are now being listed as export controlled. Mm. So the more and more intelligence we put in, the more and more restrictions the government's putting on us. Up until January this year, we could fly under the radar legally, but we, we were, as of January this year, we've got a lot more restrictions. But anyway, but going back to collaboration, mm. um, something that I'm very keen on, I work uh, quite a lot with our creative industry department over mm. at QT. Um, and it's around generating displays that educate as well as provide some sort of entertainment. So just last, we have an event called Robotronica at QUT every two years, uh, if, if you've been. Um, we've got about 18,000 people come and do all sorts of things. We, have a dis we had a display there and also at World Science Festival here. And it was on educating um, around the impact of waterway litter. So I worked with creative industries people and we created a game. It's actually a physical game where they designed robotic boats, very nice, aesthetically pleasing, functional boats from an artistic perspective. We put some intelligence in them. And as they drove around in the pool, we picked up initially different colour balls and each colour ball represented a, a uh, type of litter. And then our, their interactive designers within the creative industry developed an app. So as they were collecting these balls, they got, oh, you have saved three turtles you've done this and it's actually educating people and I think it's a really inspiring collaboration to see um, it's not just a, a a circuits and code thing it's actually mm. around that whole you know uh, artistic psychology around how you deliver educate uh, bring people in I think that's really a really powerful thing so mm. yeah. Yeah, I'm always really interested in, like, I feel like my job, sometimes people feel it's incredibly creative, but then you've got all this time of, like, you know, looking at um, spreadsheets and, um, you know, getting things in alphabetical order. But um, it's the balance between um, the kind of moments of, uh, you know, fun and unexpectedness, um, but then kind of needing all the order and, um, and rhythm in a way. Uh, and, uh, yeah... And I um, wonder what, do you guys have any questions for each other? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> no. no, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. I asked all my questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I might um, also open up to the um, audience to, if any of you have uh, any questions you'd like to ask Michael or Matt. No? All good? Oh, yeah. Was that a question about um, uh, intelligence and artificial intelligence? Built-in intelligence, yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, so we work on that precarious nexus of artificial intelligence. Um, you, there's, there, there is what you probably call full AI, like the Terminator type thing, and then there's a... Thing as, as in a kind of... Uh, independent yeah totally entity independent in independent entity uh, at the moment we are really focused on machine learning in particular deep learning this is most advanced it falls under the, the guise of ai artificial intelligence um, all our recognition systems are built on that most of your call centers and everything else that you don't sometimes you don't actually realize you're not talking to a human now um, are built on that so they're getting very very sophisticated 
they can make their decision and this is uh, they can make decisions on what they do and this is actually the frightening thing mm -hmm. um, if you look at there's a company called Boston Dynamics a very well-known um, robotics company in the US there's a really cool looking dog called spot but there's a new video out where spot has been tasked to open a door and get through the door no matter what and you'll see this dog trying to open the door and it's got its handle pulling on the on thing knocking it over and everything it's trying to get through the door now if you think of that is a, ta a a dedicated task without any moral thinking or anything that's a really frightening situation to be in mm. so part of what we're doing is not full artificial intelligence but sort of building in perception systems based on that and we still have a law a sort of a robotic ethics protocol that we're trying to follow that at this at this stage still keeps him well contained yeah mm. does that sort of answer your question or yes yeah, thank you mm. and michael i feel like you you're you're also a very interesting mind on the kind of ethics robotics uh <laughs> front uh yeah well i i don't know i pretty much straight up don't trust digital technologies and like i can see with machine learning like that is a fascinating and you you can have much more efficient i don't know production lines or like whatever your task is it can become profoundly more efficient uh, than a human could ever do it, um, which in some cases is good. But yeah, uh, general, I like that you use Terminator immediately as your description of AI because like opening the door no matter what can, you know, you can come up with some pretty awful uh, solutions to that problem. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, there's this kind of acceleration as well with, with uh, digital technology, particularly now. Um, there was a time where people talked a lot about the singularity, but it's less of a thing now. I think it's just, this is, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's on its way. But I mean, um, it's happened, kind of, it's happening, yeah, mm -hmm. so. And do you guys have, um, I suppose, hopes for the future in terms of the environment? And um, I mean, I feel like climate change is a, an incredibly critical issue that we face, but um, pollution, of course. Um, Matt, you're working on a range of fronts. Um, are there any, like, um, you know, uh, baskets of crazy ideas that you feel like, oh, if only we could do this? Or, and Matt, do you feel like you're you're kind of actually able to play out these crazy ideas? I think there's lots of crazy ideas around the world, and um, I think that's where the innovation is going to come. Um, you know, I, I've seen ideas for yeah, water security, um, using robotic systems to deploy nets and films to try and stop evaporation and recover them. That's like not so far out there, but um, robots swimming around the ocean to clean up microplastics. Mm. Um, but then what we have to be careful of is, well, are we creating more pollution mm. from robotic systems? And I think this is actually a great opportunity. Like, it shouldn't just be about the tech. It needs to be about the, the whole value chain around... Um, sustainability so what materials do we use the selection of materials what's their form factor you know this is where it's not just technology it's art it's industrial design it's material science yeah yeah um and what can we reuse that's the other thing we've got so much out there mm. we can reuse a lot and i think that's where i think some of the big ideas are going to come some when we start to embrace that then we can start looking at yeah, those wicked problems um, more. You know. mm. Yeah, just to just to comment on on that, I think as well, like a lot of like uh, the magnets used in these like in the motors that power drones and and you know electric vehicles are like com so toxic to produce that they there's only one refinery that makes them in what was formerly known as Tibet, and uh, there's a place in the U.S. gearing up to make them now, but that'll be in a few years, and they'll probably be prohibitively expensive because of all the climate regulations that will be placed on that refinery. Um, and the batteries as well, the lithium ion batteries have to be like processed in an open field like there's, and they don't last forever, you know, and all these Teslas we see, they're coal powered, like no one really makes these simple connections, but I mean, maybe you have your own solar farm at home, but that's probably going into lithium batteries, which aren't going to last forever as well. So like, yeah thinking about the materials used to produce your work is a definite, um, a, a good philosophy to have moving forward, I think. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, excellent. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've had these dilemmas in putting on the show and, um, you know, even um, the sculpture here by um, Fishley and Vice, the snowman in his uh, refrigerator, um, of course, um, you know, power is used to um, keep him all nice and frosty. Uh, so, um, you know, we're contributing to that accelerated power use to try and um, make a point. But uh, it's a dilemma often uh, how we, um, you know, is how important is uh, consciousness uh, versus any one particular action and um, how do we really um, move and motivate change? Um, how do we do this at scale? A um, lot of interesting challenges to face, but I think to be working on it together and um, having these kind of sparks of uh, conversation and um, the problem solving that I think we saw you carry out with uh, Little Sunfish is uh, really critical. So if I can um, thank you for the work that you're doing and that you've shared with us.